So first of all, I really want to rejoice in the fact that this retreat is taking place and also taking place in the form it is taking place, because I think there have been very, um, yeah, a lot of very painful things coming with the pandemic, but I also feel very grateful um, on the other end that there have been um, the, or there is the possibility to kind of come together internationally and especially for people who are not in the UK and um, who are a bit more at the fringes of the Turatna world. It's so nice to just be part of this and otherwise it would probably been um, yeah, not possible. So I've never been to Terra Loca before. So this is the first time I can actually be um, part of uh, one of those young women's retreats. I'm really grateful for that experience. And so I was really, um, I really, really loved um, uh, when Mokshidi asked me if I wanted to be part of the th uh, this retreat and also, and she suggested the theme and I thought, oh, wow, this is also very, very close to my heart and uh, very close to my own journey, the whole symbolism of, of the cremation ground and the darkening. And I think for me, um, the darkening um, especially um, has been very present or the darkenies um, because for quite some time I, um, I, I was puzzled about being a, a practitioner with a female body and trying to make sense of that. So I feel like the darkenies have been a guide uh, on that path. And so, um, and after my ordination, um, well, since my ordination, really Padmasambhava also became much more present. He appeared in dreams and I feel like um, during those difficult times, he has become much more present in my experience and manifesting. And this is also what he kind of always said. So I, I will be present in those dark times. And I also wanted to share that I, I, I was deeply touched by the image that um, Akasa Jyoti chose for the retreat's publicity, because uh, somehow it, it, it felt really kind of um, familiar, because it reminded me of um, an inner, inner image that um, also arose in, my, in, in a meditation uh, years ago, and that has been with me for some time. And it's, it's, it's very similar to that woman sitting in the, um, in the, on that cremation ground in the mountainous region. So I have that image of an old um, Tibetan woman sitting there um, in a mountainous barren land with a wide view. And she's just sitting there and there's a bit of smoke and she's um, not speaking. Uh, she never communicates, so she's just sitting there, but I really know that she's wise and that she has seen the truth and that she, that she's enlightened in a, in a sense. So, and I can just, I mean, what I sometimes do is just kind of sit at her feet and um, yeah, so just be with her and she never speaks. So she, but she communicates a lot just by being present, but yeah, it was really nice to be reminded of that image. And I have to admit that I usually don't manage to sit there very long with her in stillness and I wish <laughs> I could, but it's, a, yeah, I, I know it's, it's, it's a very important inner um, sacred space in my own experience. So the cremation ground is definitely um, a territory that I, um, that is familiar. And um, I think uh, when I reflect, I've been reflecting for this talk, uh, I have been to several cremation grounds. Um, uh, Mokshani yesterday mentioned the wilderness and the fear of being uh, alone out there in the dark. I think this is a cremation ground. I haven't been courageous enough to kind of <laughs> go into. So there's something that's still out there that I, um, I've not, uh, tried or not I mean I know I have a lot of fear being out there in the wilderness so at one point that is something to look at but um, I think for me the main cremation ground is probably um, communication in the sangha so and 
So I've, I think I've had some strong cremation grounds. Uh, I've been to some cremation grounds. And the probably the most conscious one that I remember now um, was when my first community fell apart. And so I, um, I when I asked for ordination, I had, um, we founded a community with uh, three um, friends from Berlin. So we were four of us. And uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, enthusiasm for, the, for the project. And um, but after two years, uh, it became quite clear that we somehow, our lives had started to go into different directions. And there were two people who really kind of had a vision for the community and two people who wanted something else. And it became very apparent that this was not going to work and that somehow, yeah, uh, the whole kind of vision had failed. And it was a period um, when, when there was a lot of grief. So I grieved a lot about knowing that this community was not going to work. And it was also an unknown situation because we didn't know how to kind of resolve it. Um, we just couldn't stop uh, living together because um, I mean, the market, is, it, it, I mean, we really kind of needed a solution that would arise after um, with some time. So, and also, I mean, I, I noticed my personal limitations in that situation very strongly um, because there were like also difficult conversations. And I really noticed how much I would have liked to um, behave in a different way sometimes, but I just couldn't. Um, so I, yeah, there was just the self, um, um, being confronted with myself and over it took about more I think a year or more than a year until this um, process resolved and we could kind of dissolve the community in a um, positive way but it was like really a conscious decision to stay in that situation that was quite unpleasant for some time and be with that unresolved situation uh, until it finally resolved and to kind of try and be in that communication as much as possible. And yeah, and I think working in a Buddhist center is also a really good um, place uh, to enter a cremation ground because Moksha Dee mentioned yesterday that um, our Buddha field isn't pure and we all have our views and we bring our sanskaras, so our conditioning to the situation and we have different ways of doing things. and. Uh, that sometimes makes life um, or things uh, quite difficult. And so sometimes I just don't want to have those difficulties. And I think, oh, I want us to be happily and harmoniously uh, proceeding together. But that, of course, is a desire and a craving if I want that. And I don't want uh, to look at how things actually are. And I think for me, the most difficult cremation ground in communication is to stay kind and in the connection when actually, um, when I'm confronted with anger by somebody else. And so I think my natural response uh, when I'm confronted with anger is that I, I, I get a lot of fear in my body and I really want to kind of walk away. And um, so, uh, yeah, and somehow, sometimes it seems to be that I trigger <laughs> anger in people. Um, and I'm sometimes completely surprised by that. And so what I kind of um, see as a practice is to kind of really stay in communication and um, to notice the aversion of not wanting to enter into that uh, com communication, but to just turn towards the other person and just stay open and kind and really try to understand what it was that somehow upset them. And I mean, in those conversations, I sometimes realized that I probably didn't take something into account and that my, prob my perspective was, just wasn't brought enough. Um, and sometimes we can just come to the conclusion that we just don't share the same view of the situation. And then you, you probably just can't resolve it, but it's also um, a practice to just stay with the unresolved or the unresolvable by just noticing, okay, that's how it is. 
um, but just being there and meeting um, the other person uh, as kindly as possible. And even if it's very unpleasant or I experience that as unpleasant, I have always found those conversations to be helpful and a really good learning experience and really also transformative in the longer perspective. Um, yeah, and when I was reflecting yesterday, I thought I should probably, um, probably honor this situation much more and really kind of conscious, consciously step into the cremation ground. So, I mean, at the moment I'm part of a team um, at our center uh, um, and we bought a, a new retreat center and we're trying to kind of convert the place that we bought into a retreat center over the next years. And we've already kind of faced quite a lot of internal and external problems. And it's quite obvious that we will come up against a lot of stuff um, with financial pressure and whatever um, over the next years. So I think, um, yeah, reflecting about that really helped me kind of to see that as a cremation ground and, um, yeah, so and I think, for, especially for that project, I have, like, since we've started, I have been calling on Padma Sambhava, so because somehow I feel like that this place is a place where Padma Sambhava will, will appear. And so now I just thought, okay, it's the cremation ground where he will appear. So we can really see the project as the cremation ground. And when we're ready, um, he might be there. And yeah, and also I think looking at the pandemic and the experience of the last year, um, I think, I mean, in terms of my personal situation, I, I can say that I'm, um, I'm in a really fortunate situation. So I haven't, I, I think I didn't face anything that was very uncomfortable um, or difficult to hold over the last year. Um, so, I mean, I, um, we founded a women's community and we moved in last February, so just before the pandemic, um, uh, the lockdown came. So I think I've been in a really fortunate situation to live with um, six people in a community. And also the pandemic somehow helped me um, to transform somehow because I had um, already decided before that, that I would uh, get out of my job and try and leave, um, yeah, try to do something new. And I think probably, so when the pandemic came, I, I mean, I would have lost my income as a freelancer, but somehow I had already decided that I wanted, I didn't want to do that anymore. So I think it helped me actually to kind of really kind of let go of that aspect, uh, that part of myself and to move towards something different. Um, so my personal situation has been quite, um, so I'm really grateful and know it's a fortunate situation. But in general, I mean, I'm concerned with the situation in the wider society and I mean, not just the actual suffering that um, is out there, but also um, I think there's a lot of, um, um, so what worries me is a lot of um, polarization, blame and mistrust that is happening and that is kind of splitting and creating friction um, in the wider society. And suddenly, or not suddenly, I mean, over those last months, it has become apparent that people seem to have very diff different views about what is actually happening in the world. And I can see how much suffering and polarization um, it creates when people hold very tightly um, to their views. And so sadly, I have to say that these kind of um, things, I mean, have also entered our Sangha and even our team. So I, and I find it quite, um, yeah, I mean, I find it quite challenging that people don't seem to share um, the same view anymore about what's happening in the world. And um, so it's, it's painful and I feel like there is an erosion of a sense of solidarity um, as well. So, 
And also it's a very unknown situation because I feel like it's much more unknown to last year, maybe what's going to happen. So, I mean, there is um, probably, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, in Germany, we're still in the middle of the third wave and it's not that um, it's, it's clear when, uh, what will happen and how that will end. So I think there's still a lot um, that's in the unknown that will, that we're facing. And so I think during those um, last month, I've often had the feeling that I somehow need to protect myself and my heart from those demons of doubt and um, yeah, uh, mistrust and the negative influence. And so I think that um, for me, the, the symbol of the mandala and especially the three protective circles has always spoken to me very um, strongly. So, um, and so Bhante speaks about the mandala um, as an aspect of reality that is surrounded by beauty. And I think it is the beautiful and the sacred in our own heart and minds that uh, we need to protect and that need the protection of the three uh, circles. So I, I think I've, I've consciously chosen to, to kind of work or like to kind of make sure that those rings are effective. And so the ring of fire for me, um, is really that I um, need to kind of uh, to kind of nourish the fire, my inspiration and my longing. And I think for me um, that works through, um, or most strongly works through reading and through reading uh, the life story of Padmasama, for example, life stories of. Um, his uh, disciple like Yeshe Tsogyal or the Mahasiddhas, all these um, um, or Dharma teachers like Atisha and Shantideva and all of them. So I really kind of, um, I, I really get very excited when I read those um, uh, stories of practitioners in the past um, or uh, books with uh, Buddhist art. So I recently discovered a beautiful book um, with the mandalas of Alchi, which is a monastery up in the mountains in Ladakh. And it's, it's, it's absolutely stunning. So I really kind of love to kind of um, spend time with that and just kind of um, get into this mythic world and uh, turn my mind toward that because I think that is um, some like spending like or turning my mind towards those stories and these images really creates a strong longing for something that is beyond my experience and it's a very mysterious world so I think it really helps to um, develop my devotion for um, the teachers and the tradition the lineage and so the Vajra, the Vajra wall um, I think in, in those last months has been most um, present for me in the area of meditation, because somehow I felt like, okay, those conditions of the lockdown are probably very useful conditions um, where a lot of the outer chatter and um, activity kind of fall away. So it's a useful opportunity to kind of look deeper into my meditation practice. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really kind of trying to practice diligence and really work in meditation rather than let myself uh, just um, drift away and really kind of come to my bodily experience of breathing and um, yeah, sensations. And I think the lotus wall um, um, as a third circle is uh, for me most um, intimately connected with my yidam. So it is Abu um, Lukateshra, who I have here on the shrine. And actually, um, in the 
visualization practice that I do, um, I do visualize um, the mantra Om Mani Padme Hung of uh, Avalokiteshvara as like lotus pestles. They're like lotus petals opening around my heart and revolving around my heart. So that is the same kind of symbol of the lotus petals. And so usually um, Avalokiteshvara is uh, he's a, a white figure, so a symbol of purity and um, yeah, I think what he embodies is really the resonance and the vibration um, with the suffering of all beings um, and a very, very sincere heart wish that is also expressed through, um, through the mudra. Um, the heart wish uh, for um, the suffering to end th um, and for this, uh, yeah, for all beings to find uh, liberation through awakening. So, yeah, these are just how those three circles, um, are, or how are they most, al most alive for me uh, right now? And when I reflected about it, I thought it's interesting because I think sitting in the cremation ground, when I really kind of decide to step in the cremation ground, I can also see my own limitations with respect or in relation to those circles of protection. So, I mean, I can really um, see then when my ego keeps me from surrendering uh, fully uh, to the blessings of the lineage or to the lineage of teachers and when my devotion might only feel half-hearted and that can feel quite painful um, or I can also very clearly see how much my mind wants to go into stories and concepts and just doesn't want to stay with uh, or turn towards my physical um, experience. Or I also notice um, um, that it's often difficult to hold um, and just sit um, with the suffering of somebody else. So I think, yeah, just, I think that's probably the, the, what Bante mentioned in the talk, you are just confronted uh, with yourself and your own limitations. And I really feel that this friction creates a strong longing um, to change and to transform. And sometimes I've noticed when I can really um, stay there and quite often in the most difficult uh, or unpleasant moments, when I really manage to kind of stay long enough um, with my experience, it may happen that suddenly um, there's a collapse into the sacred and um, a moment when the ordinary breaks down somehow. And those moments are usually moments um, of a very physical experience when I experience that my body is being flooded with warmth or a deep sense of devotion or joy or resonance. And so I think that these are actually experience um, of the nectar from the skull cup, a moment of um, Padmasambhava's bliss. So that's it, thank you. <laughs>